Hello, Timmies. Thank you for joining us for this Purdue Timmy Global Health podcast. Our mission for this podcast is to educate our members on global health issues and promote meaningful engagement in our societies through fruitful conversation, lifelong learning, and advocacy. My name is Ella Domingo, Timmy's Global Health Roundtable Chair, and I'm a second year Doctor of Pharmacy student here at Purdue University. Today, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Jason Perry, a visiting assistant professor at Purdue's Honors College, as this episode guest to discuss his perspective and research in sustainable design. I'm really excited for this episode. Jason, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Ella. How has your afternoon been so far? I, I know this is a really great start to my day. Hi, it's, it's been good, but I'm looking forward to this conversation. So to start us off, it's always neat to learn more about how individuals just get started in their particular field of expertise. So Jason, if you could feel free to tell us a bit about what you do regarding your personal and professional interests, that would be great. Sure. I, I guess just to sketch out the academic trajectory, uh, I started uh, studying music at the University of Texas at Dallas as an undergraduate. Um, actually, that's, that's a little inexact because um, UT Dallas is a bit like Purdue. It's a very STEM heavy school. And so they kind of lump all the artsy fields together because there's not that many students who are, who are taking those courses. Uh, so they had a catch-all major called art and performance and you had to choose a specialization within that. So I started out doing music, um, went to theater and ended up in, in art history. Um, but while I was there, I was able to take some advanced graduate courses uh, in literature and philosophy. So reading people like James Joyce and, and Martin Heidegger. And that was just a, a level of kind of intellectual, I'll say it, intellectual pleasure that I just didn't know existed, right? Uh, and I recall one day coming out of a seminar room, uh, we'd been reading uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. And the seminar was three hours long and we only got through the first page. You know, we spent three hours going on this one page and I, and I realized that this was a, you know, I, I knew how to read, but I realized that I didn't, I was actually learning how to read, if that makes sense. Um, and I walked out of that room and the sky, you know, the blue sky seemed more blue and the air seemed more crisp. And, you know, I felt like I'd been given these x-ray goggles where I could kind of see under things. And I, you know, I, I'd been initiated into this kind of like, I don't know, a circle where I kind of, I, I had this knowledge of how things worked. And, you know, it was a bit like, uh, like a conversion experience, I guess. And, and you know, it, it, you could say that I've been kind of chasing that high ever since in a, in a way, right? And, and so I decided to go and get a PhD and I, I went to, into a department of comparative literature because it seemed like that was the discipline that gave you the most flexibility. There were people in that department studying music and translation and psychology and economics. Uh, and I, I really liked having that sort of flexibility. And so I ended up writing a dissertation about how people reconstruct narratives of the past, looking at novelists, um, but also human rights investigators, right, who are both people charged with kind of putting together narratives about, about what has happened and using different kind of techniques of doing so. Uh, and both of these people, right, novelists and human rights investigators are kind of um, involved in the same kind of problem. There's an absence of evidence that they have to kind of like do a, a bit of speculation in order to kind of make a coherent and compelling narrative about something that occurred because no historical record is complete. Um, and, and so that was the, the kind of focus of that. And, you know, I, I finished the PhD in 2017 and joined the Purdue faculty a year later in, in 2018. And it was at that point that I started looking at, you know, the similar problem with um, sustainable design insofar as we have these models, you know, instead of reconstructing the past, we can think about the future. We have these models, these climate models that, that are telling us stories about what is going to happen to our planet under different kind of trajectories. And there's just this feedback loop between what these models are telling us and, and what we're doing is so broken, right? I mean, there's this, you know, the, the these models are giving us kind of clear messages in terms of what kinds of policies we should be adopting uh, and 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 we're just not and and so it occurred to me that this is a kind of a, a weird like inverse of the problem i had been working on it's like okay we have these stories about the future uh, and they're fragmented and they're incomplete but we should be doing something to kind of um you know we we need to fill out that narrative 
as it were, right? To kind of get us on, a, on the right track. And so that was how I got interested in, in sustainable design. That's an incredible way to look at the world, especially when you talked about your beginnings and, and all of these things that you're looking into right now. If you could tell us a little bit more about this article you have coming on sustainable design in Taipei, what are the different approaches to sustainability that you explore in this? Sure. So the, the article is born of a, um, a kind of bit of good fortune. I was able to get a grant uh, in the middle of my PhD to go to Taiwan to present at a conference. And, you know, the conference was quite good, um, but I, I made the trip with a kind of secret mission in my heart. Uh, there was an architect named Marco Casagrande, whose work I'd been following for a, a few years, and, and he, he does most of his work in, in Taiwan, in, in, in the Taipei area. And I, I encourage everyone to go and, and seek out some photographs of, of his buildings that are very kind of interesting. You know, he would take these abandoned office blocks and kind of, you know, start planting trees in them and cut holes in the floors and the, and the walls so roots could kind of grow uh, within them. And, and you know, it's just, a, it was a very different vision of the sustainable city than anything I'd been accustomed to. You know, he's, from, he's from Lapland and has this kind of, I don't know, very, very kind of different look outlook on on the world and and so i, I you know the i went to go present at the conference but i really wanted to go and see his buildings uh but i was a bit unlucky because a lot of them ha had either been abandoned and were in you know just in a dilapidated state or they'd been recently demolished so there wasn't actually a whole lot for me to to see though he had uh, made a proposal for um, what he called the paris city and there was this kind of small island in the middle of the Damsui River in, in Taipei, uh, which is used by people for gardening, growing food and, and things like this. And he wanted to kind of build a, a framework, kind of like a, like a little city on stilts in the middle of this river. And I managed to meet in Taipei one of his kind of colleagues, another architect he works with. And, you know, he said, you know, in the photographs, it's confined to the river, but he really wants this stilt city to kind of take over, you know, just like expand beyond the, the banks of the river. And he wants this to be the, the new Taipei. And so I decided to go and, and see this island for myself to try and imagine how it would be turned into this, um, into this stilt city. And so, you know, you have to like cross this very busy bridge where there's just thousands of scooters kind of going, going by. Uh, and you look down over the top and sure enough, in the middle of this river, there are people farming, the like, tiny little shacks they built themselves and like little fields of, of crops. And, and it did actually look a bit like the renderings that he had designed about what this city would look like, which when you look at sustainable design projects, the gap between the rendering and what people end up actually building is often quite dramatic, right? Often the photograph, you know, the, the digital photograph looks really amazing, but when it's actually built, it looks, you know, ridiculous and horrible. Um, but it seemed as if that gap was a bit smaller in this case. But, you know, in order to see, you know, to get to this site where the, the power city was going to be built, I had to actually pass another large construction site uh, where there was a, a luxury apartment complex being built called the Agora Garden uh, by a, a Belgian architect named uh, Vincent Caibo. And this was about as different a building from Casa Grande's works as you can imagine. You know, it's a multi-million dollar apartment complex. It has a a um, uh, elevator just for people's paintings and sports cars. And, uh, you know, I, I think it ended up being the most expensive piece of real estate in, in, in Taiwanese history. And, you know, it, it has trees on each uh, balcony. And so it was advertised as a, um, a smog eating building. Uh, but when you dig into the facts, I mean, the amount of smog that it eats, uh, you know, is maybe 10% of you know, that emitted by the cars that would be housed in its own garage, right? I mean, it, you know, it's just really, and, and of course it's extremely costly. So most people can't, uh, won't, won't be able to, to live there. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, according to a lot of these climate models, Taipei is in for quite a lot of sea level rise. And so it occurred to me that, although it's, you know, quite an expensive piece of real estate, there's a good chance that portions of it might be underwater in a, in a century. Uh, whereas, you know, Casa Grande Stilt City could kind of, you know, just keep <laughs> moving, moving up, kind of building, building upwards as the, as the sea came in. So in that sense, it seemed a lot more, a lot more resilient. And it occurred to me that looking at these two buildings, 
you know, they, they were kind of um, stand-ins for kind of two very different approaches to sustainable design. Um, the one we could maybe call a kind of return to vernacular that emphasizes things like local materials, local knowledge, and, you know, the idea being that there are societies out there that have built sustainable societies, you know, a lot of the indigenous uh, groups around the world, and we can learn from them. Right. And, and, you know, if we if we just take some of those lessons into account, we can start to build a world that that is actually, you know, stays within planetary boundaries. Uh, against that, you have the, the kind of maybe we could call them techno utopians or something, you know, who, who see, um, you know, technology as creating new forms of well-being for people. Right. And um, I think, you know, if I remember correctly, there's a there's a line where, you know, um, Tolstoy was being criticized that uh, electricity and the steam engine had done more for people than chastity and vegetarianism. And this is kind of the, you know, if you could, if you could put the techno utopian philosophy in a nutshell, I think this would, this would be it. Um, and, you know, an acknowledgement that, you know, um, standard of living is going up around the world and uh, you know as people get richer they prefer cleaner environments and so you know we just need to make everyone more rich and you know increase the standard of living everywhere get new technology and innovation and and that'll take care of the environmental problem and uh, you know it's in a debate that goes back and forth of course then the the um the more ecological minded people will say, but you know, there's only so many resources on this planet and we can just keep you know expanding you know our, our use of them indefinitely. And, you know, as in most cases where there's kind of a, a discourse that's highly polarized, that the truth is somewhere in between, I think, right? It's true that we need to immediately curtail some industries. It's true that we can learn a lot from other societies, but, you know, it, it is also true uh, that technology has a role to play, right? And in, in, uh, in, in developing a, a, a sustainable society and that we need to rapidly scale up certain industries right even as we even as we curtail and and close down others and so you know i saw in these two buildings and this is kind of what the the um, article says you know like how can we enact a dialogue because they're not that far apart in taipei right but it's it's like you know it's like living in in, a, in different worlds and so you know this was the, the the article was kind of a thought exercise you know what middle ground is there how can we enact a conversation between these two buildings uh, and you know devise a, a you know, pathway forward that kind of like acknowledges uh, the claims on, on on both sides and tries to kind of find a find a middle ground i think middle ground is a perfect way to put it because going into it i always thought okay sustainability that's like high tech buildings all of these futuristic looking contraptions that are going to help us in this pursuit to um, help conserve our, our resources on, on this planet. So I like that it's a middle ground, it's a conversation, and, and we should look around at the different things that we can consider and not just be fixed and have tunnel vision on one specific approach. Absolutely. I, I mean, it, it may help to kind of, you know, if we, this isn't a, a new debate either, right? I mean, this is something that's been going on for, for a while. And I think it's fair to say that the, the kind of the techno utopians won the, won the 20th century. You know, if you go to a city like uh, Brasilia, uh, the, the capital of Brazil, I mean, this is a, this is a city that is very much kind of, you know, an artifact of a certain kind of era in the history of technological utopianism, where this idea was that, you know, we'll have a city that, you know, we can plan it from scratch, we'll, you know, make it so it looks beautiful on, on satellite imagery, and people will drive their cars to work, and they'll drive them home, and, uh, you know, we'll have this city that is thoroughly kind of regimented according to function so that there's a kind of residential area and a kind of a, a working area. But when you actually go there, right, you see what the what some of the problems are, right? You have a lot of people who cannot afford cars. And so they're forced to make that, you know, their daily commute is, is running across eight lanes of traffic, trying not to get flattened, right? And, and there's no sidewalk. So they're just having to walk across these dirt paths, right? Um, you know, in the, in the middle of the, you know, in this kind of hot Brazilian sun. And, and so this shows, I think, some of the, the short-sightedness of, um, you know, this position, this idea that, you know, obviously all kinds of innovations have um, unforeseen, uh, unforeseen effects. And, uh, and in that sense, you know, 
there's a claim to be made that you know although it's slightly less technologically sophisticated you know the, i mean the bicycle is a is you know a more advanced artifact in in some respects insofar as uh you know it takes up less space and it allows people more people to use a, a similar you know you can fit more people on a bike lane in, in less space than you can fit on a on a on a highway and also there's no um there's there's no virtually no carbon emissions right associated with the activity of um, of biking and, and so you know we have to be i think much more selective in our technologies you know, the, the sci-fi writer neil stevenson has a word called a mystics which he uses to kind of denote exactly this kind of like selective approach to technology and you know he says if you look at our current civilization we have amazing telecommunications infrastructure right we can stream movies all day on these tiny little devices with with no disruption um but you know <laughs> in terms of you know we have no trains and our infrastructure you know our physical infrastructure is falling apart and so this is a, a kind of choice we've made as a civilization where to invest and what technologies to adopt and, and kind of which ones are not to and you know maybe we want to rethink that selectivity right maybe there are other choices that we can make and um, that would be much better you know maybe we need to invest in carbon scrubbing machines right that kind of suck carbon out of the atmosphere you know maybe this is a you know these rarely you know these are things that don't really exist at scale but maybe they need to and maybe we need to put tons of you know resources into uh, you know, innovating with with this kind of technology right or, or fusion reactors i don't know what, whatever it is um you know uh that we just have to be smarter about how we make these about how we make these decisions definitely and you mentioned investing into our civilizations and this sort of brings us to the topic of integration and biodiversity hotspots. So you've discussed before how urban planners could start integrating the needs of plants and animals. And I find this really fascinating. I've never really delved into this before. Sure, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a few ways of, of doing this. Uh, and I, I think the best way is to kind of, you know, let plants and animals become the architecture professors of the 21st century. Um, you know. Uh, project that I'm working on at the moment uh, involved kind of a collection of an archive of news reports and, and scientific papers that showed how endangered species are kind of reclaiming abandoned ruins around the world. Uh, so just to give some examples, you know, the most endangered species of seagull in the world has taken up residence in a flooded office block in Christchurch, New Zealand. It's not at all clear what about this office block, you know, attracts these seagulls, but they seem to really, really like it. Um, you know, in castles across um, Eastern Europe, they found rare species of mollusks thriving in great numbers. Um, bats have been found in disused bunkers in places as far apart as Israel and uh, Okinawa. Uh, and so the idea is that, you know, these, while ruins are typically associated with a kind of dystopian imaginary, uh, these ruins actually, I think, should inspire us. You know, they are the kind of seeds of a, of a, of a better future, but we have to kind of like pay attention to them and, and, and think about what they're saying. And what they're saying is that, you know, the, the biodiversity of the hotspots of the future can be built. We, we, can, we can make them, that there's actually a, a place for design in the construction of biodiversity hotspots, which is not something that is, I think, um, immediately clear, especially if you look at the, a lot of the literature about environmental conservation. It's typically about, you know, stripping back human influence in a, in a landscape, right? Um, this language of rewilding, which, you know, I, I generally support, but, you know, this is something that's kind of typical is this idea that we need to return a landscape to some kind of prior state. And, and what these select instances show us is that actually, you know, in, in, in particular cases, it's possible for a, a kind of anthropogenic landscape or a, a landscape that's been altered by human activity to host more and more different kinds of species than would be the case otherwise. And so, you know, how can we learn from these buildings? How can we learn from this flooded office block? You know, how to make reservations for endangered seagulls? How can we learn from, you know, these uh, um, bunkers? How to make, you know, reserves for bats? You know, these, these are kinds of things that I think we can, we can start asking ourselves. Uh, and it raises kind of two 
courses of action for architects. On the one hand, there's a, a program of retrofitting that needs to happen, right? So how can we take these lessons and kind of alter our existing uh, structures so as to make them more hospitable, right, to, to non-human species? Uh, and I think one architect doing great work here is Joyce Huang, who actually I was able to invite um, to um, Purdue in, in 2019 to come and, and give a give a lecture. And you know, she does things like building exoskeletons that you can kind of attach to the side of the of a building that will allow various species to kind of come and come and make a home there. But it's also, you know, there's something like a like an anticipatory aspect of, of the design process where this can influence us as well, insofar as we can we can, you know, build things into the design with an eye towards that building's future existence as a biodiversity hotspot, right? So if the average kind of lifespan of a building is 50 years, um, you know, that's hardly any time at all. And in, in ecological terms, that's that's really hardly any time. And and so, you know, we can we can think about a, a you know, if a, if a building, you know, most of it spends most of its life as a, as a ruin, right? And, and so actually maybe it's, it's afterlife is where should, we should be investing a lot of our attention right, during the design process. What is this going to look like? Um, um, when it's no longer serving kind of some some human use uh, and i think you know this implies a whole new research program where suddenly we need ecologists are going to have to talk to architects are going to have to talk to people studying you know animal psychology and uh, evolutionary biology and all these things are going to all these fields are going to have to have a conversation to figure out how to kind of maximize the capacities for design to kind of foster biodiversity in an age of ecological collapse uh, and, and there are other ways of doing this as well. One um, solution or one kind of approach that I've talked a bit about is the use of soundscape as a kind of design medium where, you know, if you look at a spectrogram of a functioning ecosystem, you can, you know, people have figured out that these evolve over time so that animals use slightly different frequencies. So they don't overlap. And this allows more and more different kinds of animals to communicate simultaneously so that, you know, it's, it's just like, telecom companies, you know, auction off um, bandwidth, right? So that, you know, mobile phone providers aren't, um, aren't competing on the, on the same, on, on the same, um, on the same frequencies. And, you know, we can do the same, we can think about this as we design our, our cities, right? What would it mean to kind of look at these spectrograms, figure out what communication channels are being used by endangered species and kind of make sure we leave those blank, right? Or leave those empty so that when we're designing things like, you know, sirens or car alarms or, AC systems, we can try and make sure that, you know, it has a sonic profile that kind of doesn't overlap with, you know, the, the kind of the, the communication channels of used by animals, because it's becoming increasingly apparent that, you know, a functioning ecosystem isn't just about, you know, uh, predator prey relationships, but it's also about the exchange of science, right, and, and communications that, um, you know, the ability of plants and animals to kind of engage in this sort of communication is just as important as their ability to kind of, you know, find food to, to eat, um, but it's not something that has really um, made an impact in, in the field of design. So that's another way that, that you know, architects can, can think about the, the non-human and the non-human users of their environments as they, as they go about you know, designing the, the cities of the future. And going into different places like New Zealand, and then you talked about Taipei, we can probably take the opportunity to zoom out a bit and consider the planet as a design project in terms of sustainability. So could you give us a little bit more insight on that? Sure. I, I mean, in a, in a sense, you know, this word Anthropocene, um, which you know, went from being a obscure term that might pop up at a, at a geology conference to becoming you know, nearly ubiquitous, which me merely refers to this proposed epoch uh, where human activity is, is kind of the driving force, you know, where a geological epoch that, you know, in millions of years will actually be able to tell when, you know, human has started, came about because they'll leave a, a geological market that, will, that would endure for that period of time. Um, you know, one way of summarizing this insight is that the, the world has become a kind of artifact Right, and and um, there are news reports every day. Right, you find plastic at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, or you know, in the in the Arctic, um, you know, the 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 kind of the traces of human activity are already everywhere. And you know, this is quite a different situation than that envisioned by a lot of the kind of Enlightenment thinkers who were maybe among the first to think about the planet as a as a 
testing ground for, for design. Um, you know, you had people who thought we could build palaces on the top of uh, mountains or, you know, under the oceans that we'd be able to change the course of rivers at will, which, you know, of course we, we do, but, you know, they thought we would do it for aesthetic purposes, you know, because we, it, would, it would look nicer if a, if a river went a, a certain way rather than others. Uh, and instead, right, we're dealing with this case where it's all these sort of byproducts of, of our activity are kind of changing the planet in certain ways. So now, you know, instead of thinking about rerouting the course of a river to make it more aesthetically appealing, we're suddenly really concerned about, you know, the concentration of certain kinds of molecules uh, in, in the atmosphere. And I, I had a bit of a, an awakening reading a, a paper that came out in 2018 and got a bit of um, got a bit of attention at the time, it was called uh, Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. And this paper was quite stark, written by some you know, quite prestigious climatologists. Uh, it basically said that the climate system with which humans are familiar, that the only, the only climate system with which our species is, is familiar is effectively over, um, and there's, there's no going back. And that there are kind of two options ahead of us, two kind of distinct trajectories. Um, the one that they say is most likely to happen has the rather unappealing name of hothouse earth. And, you know, hothouse earth is basically a pattern where, where runaway warming occurs, where there are certain kind of dominoes built into the earth system. And, and once one starts to fall, then they kind of trigger the others. And at that point, it, you know, humans aren't really able to intervene in that process, right? And, and we could get in a couple centuries to conditions approximating the, the Eocene, which is a, a time when, you know, reptiles swam in a swampy Arctic, you know, that was, that was quite, quite humid, you know, that's, that's the kind of future they see heading for us. And one, you know, if you do a bit more research into the history of this term hothouse earth, one, one kind of dis disappointing or kind of um, dispiriting fact that you find out is that it was actually coined in the, in the seventies um, by, you know, that we've been aware of this possibility for, for quite a long time, but that hasn't, that hasn't kind of affected how we, um, how we regulate things. Uh, but they do say that there's a possibility that we could develop what they call a, a stabilized earth pathway. Um, that you know there will be changes from the climate system we're familiar with, but they won't be as drastic, right? We'll still recognize the place. Uh, but they say that this trajectory won't exist unless people consciously design it. And uh, so we have to bring it into being, which is quite something to ask of, uh, of our species, right? I mean, it's, it's one thing to design an object, right? To give it certain contours so that it's, it has certain functions, but to design a kind of a, a climate system is, is rather ambitious. Um, but really, this is, these are the stakes, and, and this is kind of where we need, um, you know, this, this is, should be the goal, right, of our kind of policies, right? How do we go about crafting this kind of globe-spanning meta system, um, which will involve kind of acts of chemical and, and biological engineering on, on, a, on a massive scale and in order to preserve something like a like a functional biosphere or at least one that we can kind of one that we can kind of work with uh, and one thing i think that's important when we're you know thinking about this is that it's not you know we've talked about technology and technology has a, has a role to play but also just in terms of our political systems right or our economic systems i, I think that you know we have to rethink our institutions um so as to kind of you know make them compatible with this aim of you know staying within planetary boundaries so you know how do we create a political system where decision making is taking into account this data that um, climate models are giving us right um, in a, in a more kind of in, with with more efficacy than is currently the case how do we create an economic system where you know things like greenhouse emissions are not just discounted right or kind of like rendered external to any kind of um, cost benefit analysis um, and and this requires a, a lot of rethinking right um, you know if you listen to most any politician they'll still talk about growing GDP, right? And, and they'll still talk about with horror about the, the national debt, but you know, we don't talk about the ecological debt, right? That future generations will have to, and, and the kind of enormous costs associated with that. Um, we don't talk about the technical debt, right? Of the, the kind of, the fact that our infrastructure is not keeping pace and our infrastructure developments are not keeping pace with the way in which the planet is, is changing. And this is going to involve, you know, um, huge costs down the road. And, and the, the, the kind of more we put off dealing with these, 
issues the, the larger the the costs get um until you know I, I don't know what happens then you get some kind of um, collapse scenario i guess um but anyway it, it, we have to you know we have to think about institutional design as a as a form of geoengineering um and we have to think about geoengineering not as something that occurs you know in you know speculative scenarios where you spray sulfur into the atmosphere to reflect sunlight or something like this, but actually as a as an aim of politics, right? That that the design of the Earth um, is something that you know, as these climatologists said, we have to do, right? If, if we want a a kind of a, a biosphere and a climate system that we can that we can work with. Um, so when we look at the the kind of political landscape and we, and we look at the future, I mean, this is something that we should kind of always always keep in mind. Um, and as I say, this will require probably rethinking not only you know the way we design cities and, and the way we use technology and where we put our resources in terms of fostering innovation, uh, but also how we design the majors that students take, right? We need, a, we need to raise a generation of planetary designers who are comfortable kind of thinking on this scale um, and who are com comfortable thinking about institutional design as a mode of geoengineering. Uh, so these are, these are some of the kind of, these are the stakes that I think get highlighted when you think about the, the planet as a, as a design project. Um, and I think that, you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing uh, also, just to have some people really, you know, well versed in, in the kind of the different kinds of systems that we're going to need in order to make a, a functioning biosphere happen. And as you were sharing all of that, a lot of what stuck out to me and really resonated with me was maximizing what we have and being conscious and aware and intentional with our environments and what we put into them. I think you did a brilliant job of just tying the different levels of sustainability together throughout this conversation. So you mentioned building, city, planetary level, and you were explaining to me before how we can consider technology as a way for us to understand and integrate with nature. So I think this is brilliant. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, I suppose one thing that, uh, all these things have in common is that you know we need to try and negotiate the limits of our own subjectivity insofar as you know we have to start taking seriously the idea that we share this planet with lots of other beings that those beings have internal worlds um, and you know we need to start thinking about how do we take those internal worlds into account in our decision-making process, whether it's how we design a, a building or how we craft a kind of macroeconomic policy. And, you know, as, a, as someone who, who studied literature, I, I can't help but think that, you know, uh, when you read something like Anna Karenina, right, I mean, I, I am obviously not a, a female 19th century aristocrat, but when I read Anna Karenina, I get a sense of what it is like to be a 19th century female aristocrat. Uh, and, you know, we need something like this. You know, the, I mean, this is what literature is great for, right? It, it allows you to kind of like accrue experience that you would not have access to otherwise. It allows you to kind of like broaden the number of perspectives which you can bear, you know, which, which you can bring to bear on the world. Um, and we need to do something similar for, um, for non-humans, right? Uh, we need to think about how do, you know, how does a wildflower see this building, you know, if it has to live in this environment and how can we kind of like adjust the way we build it so as to kind of maximize the, the, the way a, a, a wildflower would, would experience it, um, which, you know, it involves kind of taking seriously some other kinds of metaphysics and some other kinds of conceptions of, of politics. I mean, one of the, you know, if you read some political anthropology you know you you can come across people who you know do take non-human perspectives into account in their decision making processes right uh, so this is something that we have to uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel we can just kind of learn learn from these examples so for example the the Yagua Indians uh, in the Amazon basin have a conception of, of politics that is you know not limited to the human being they see politics uh, and and the rainforest itself as a, as a kind of political arena in, in which not only are there multiple kinds of political entities but there's multiple kinds of political speech 
movement. So that the scent of a flower is a kind of political speech insofar as it sends a message that kind of either attracts or repels um, other entities, that it creates a kind of set of alliances and, and enmities. Um, and, and that species have kind of networks um, that you know, include some and, and, and they, they draw boundaries. Um, and you know, this is the a kind of the, the, consent, the conception of politics that I think we need to start adopting, right? Um, we need to start thinking about what it means to share a world with other kinds of political entities that are capable of, of communicating in, in meaningful ways. And I think that this is one area where technology can, can really help insofar as, you know, there's some really amazing work being done. And I'm very happy actually hosting a guest speaker next week named uh, Dr. Thomas Schmickel for a class I'm teaching at, at Purdue this semester, uh, who is designing kind of biohybrid systems, what he calls biohybrid systems. Um, so, you know, using things like robots to help different kinds of species communicate. Uh, and this is the, the kind of the work that I think you know, perhaps technology and, and things like artificial intelligence can most profitably contribute to the project of, of designing a sustainable planet, you know, by helping make those forms of political speech that non-humans are engaged in, make them intelligible for us, right? And, and kind of somehow figure out ways to incorporate those into our, our decision-making um, decision processes. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think this is one way to kind of start building a, a viable multi-species society that, you know, not only is hospitable towards um, non-human beings, plants and animals, but also towards the artificial agents, right? The various algorithms and, and robotists that, that help make those non-human perspectives intelligible to us. Um, that technology as a kind of mediator, not something that alienates us from the physical world, but something that actually helps us kind of understand it uh, in, in a kind of more granular level um, where we can start to kind of reshape our institutions to, to kind of accommodate the knowledge that that they, they that they bring to us and you know that's a that's a kind of futurism that i'm i'm really interested in and, and really invested in trying to help bring about and i think what you said about if you were a wildflower how would you view this building if you were a seagull or a bat how would you look at these civilizations that we're building would it work with um your way of life like you said in, in your explanation of how you sort of began your educational journey, how you had these x-ray goggles, how you could just view the world in different eyes. And I think that's just so essential to now with what we're facing with our ecological crisis. Um, but Jason, what would be the main takeaway you really want listeners to grasp and act upon? Sure. I mean, I think that one message that is quite essential that doesn't get articulated uh, nearly frequently enough is that, you know, as we as we talk about sustainable design, you know, uh, from the scale of the, the city to that of the planet, um, you know, we're also talking about uh, decarbonization. Right? We're talking about the kind of the the shifting of the kind of energy substrate that powers uh, our civilization. And when we think about you know adaptation to climate change, I, I often see it described as a, as a kind of, in, in terms of sacrifice, right? Or we have to, we have to give up certain things. And, and one thing I think I, you know, as a, as a repost to that, I think, you know, there are plenty of instances where you can think about how decarbonization can increase quality of life, right? You know, when I was living in Dallas, Texas, right? There were people who spent two hours a day driving to and driving from work, you know, sitting in traffic. And, you know, they spent more time on the highway with other drivers in traffic than they did with their own children. You know, and, and uh, you know, we can give that up, I think, without losing <laughs> quality, quality of life. And we can build alternatives that might be better. Um, that, you know, decarbonization can increase quality of life. Pedestrian zones and bike lanes make cities better, as well as reducing their carbon footprints, right? Bus systems that are functional, light rail, these things. Um, you know, there, there are lots of ways in which we can, you know, simultaneously kind of abandon um, things that actually make life horrible and, and build better alternatives. Uh, so I think, you know, if students listening to this need some kind of inspirational message, I mean, I think this is, this is it, right? That we think about the future with this kind of like anxiety and guilt and the need to sacrifice, but no, let's, let's figure out how to make really cool things, right? And then let's figure out how to make a really cool environment where people can kind of, you know, uh, 
express themselves and and uh, live good lives while also kind of like respecting all those beings that we share the planet with on on whose well-being our well-being also depends thank you jason and for anyone listening uh just consider everything that we've laid out here and really be open to how we can go about increasing the quality of life being intentional with our our surrounding environment and i think we're just going to be better for it in the future So to our listeners, we encourage you to check out the additional resources on this topic in the links provided. And if you're on Spotify, give us a follow. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. And that's all for this episode. Stay safe and stay well, Timmies. And we will see you next time on our next Timmy Global Health podcast.